welcome to Aspects of Riding with your host, James Kelly. Now, let's get right. Here's your host, James Kelly. Hello and welcome to Aspects of Riding. I'm your host, James Kelly. And today we have with us Brian Gardner. And we're going to be talking about... Yeah. Writing. Be, yeah, <laughs> writing. And you have two novels that you've written. Yeah. But you're a journalist. I am. I wrote an article for Auto Week magazine on a particular auto racing show, which I love auto racing. And I sent it in to the San Francisco Motor Riders Association. And they said, this is a first place winner. So there we go. Is that how you got started in journalism? Yeah. And then I was also had a real fun gig, let me tell you. They would give me a car a week. Mm -hmm. And I would drive the car, test drive it, and write articles. My son, who was eight at the time, said, Dad, this is the greatest job any father ever had. <laughs> That's cool. We had Miatas and we had wow. Ford probes with a turbo and, you know, it was really fun. All right. So that's how I got started writing, yeah. And then from there it went to what? Then it went more into being in bands and writing songs. And then when I saw the trouble the world was in, and we'll talk about this book second, we'll talk about the, the science fiction book first, but I'll jump ahead for a second. When I saw the trouble the world was in, I thought, well, maybe I'll go into politics. And when I took a look at my age, coupled with the amount of money you need, mm -hmm. like $50 million or more to be a U.S. senator, yeah. I said, I'm going to have to make promises to people who I will not want to do what they are telling me to do. Mm -hmm. So I said, I know what I'll do. I'll write a book, and then I can say what I want right. and feel that I'm still helping out. All of this, by the way, comes from my dad, who was a scout leader, who made us leave the campsite in better shape than what you found than when we found it. And so I've, you know, I was a rock and roll drummer. He said, he's not listening to anything I say. <laughs> and that was in 62, 1962. Mm -hmm. And I've transferred that over to try to help out this world yeah. and leave it in better shape. So, yeah. yeah. So which book do you want to talk about first? We'll talk about this one here, The Banished. It's a okay. science fiction novelette, I guess you would call it. It's pretty, yeah. pretty short. Novelette. And how did that come about? This came about because I'm a Star Trek fan, and I said, I'm just going to try to write a story about science fiction, because I had seen the, the Writers of the Future contest. I had been uh, talking to other people. I was working on a local Star Trek production, and I said, let me try to write a, a story and see where it goes. I had so much fun, James, coming up with names places because this is not on earth let me right yes yeah, futuristic <laughs> yeah futuristic yeah. but it's it's really a human interest story that's what i think why i think people that maybe i don't really like science fiction they would read this and go oh my gosh it's people and their struggles to try to get a, a good government in place people who've been banished to this lonely planet realizing they shouldn't be there how do we get back to our where we're supposed to be and mm -hmm. You know, that yeah. kind of aspect to it. So did this, how did this come about to you? You were just sitting there thinking about it one day? I write from dreams sometimes, so that's how a lot of mine come about. It, it wasn't from dreams, but I was writing script for the local Star Trek production. And that got me into, and some of the, the skits turned out, I said, gosh, that turned out pretty good. And I also enjoyed directing. But then when that kind of ended and people were doing something else, that kind of wrapped up, then I said, I want to write a science fiction story that's not a Star Trek story with Spock and Kirk and all that. I want, I want a new characters, new locations, but I know that a story has to have, you know, you can't just say, uh, the guy wanted to buy a boat, so he went down and paid the cash for the boat. That's not interesting. Right, right. The guy couldn't find the boat. He had, to, you know, there were thugs chasing him while he's trying to mm. buy the boat, you know. So I came up with an idea for there to be intrigue and stress and... You know, is this going to work out okay? And it was just fun from beginning to end to write this. So you mentioned Star Trek. Yeah. You, you wrote for Star Trek. You're talking about the local production here at the Westgate? No, this was a local, local production of oh, Star Trek okay. fans. Okay. And it was really fun. I was in charge of props. And then I got in charge of writing some of the scripts. And then I got to play some of the mm, characters. Okay. It was really fun. And then I got bitten by the directing. I haven't done any directing since, but I love directing. Okay. Oh my gosh, I just love it. You know, getting an actor. Well, how would you act if your ship was just blown up? Or how would you act if you're the captain? Not telling them what to say, mm -hmm. but 
you know, as a director, drawing out from them. Yeah, if, if I was a captain, I wouldn't be like, hey, guys, do whatever you want. Okay, let's get those bulkheads secured and let's get going, you know. Yeah, yeah. But you have to get an actor to come. Can I tell you one story? Sure. Oh, my gosh, so funny. We had this guy who was so friendly. If you bumped into his car, he'd say, no problem, whatever. He was playing a part where he was mad because they weren't unloading his ship in time. Okay. And he goes... I'm really upset because you haven't unloaded my ship. Can you please hurry? I said, no, no, Colin, please give me more. It took four times. And finally, I said, think of the last time somebody really upset you. Take, uh, uh, you know, uh, action. And then he got mad enough. But as a director, I had to pull that, pull that out, out of him. him. That was so fun. Yeah. That was That's so interesting fun. you say that because, you know, I, we did a pilot or we're working on a pilot for a, a script I wrote. Yeah. And there was a young lady who had never acted before in her life. Okay. <sighs> But we had, she was a last minute replacement. We needed someone, we needed a pretty girl. And it was a bedroom scene in the 1900s. And I have to tell you what was funny about that is, is that she only had one line and the actor who was playing opposite her, you could tell there was chemistry there, okay? And they'd never met before, but you could tell there was some chemistry. Yeah. And she's supposed to be playing this lady who's nude in bed and he's painting her nude. And she wakes up and see he's painting her. <laughs> and she pulls the covers up real, real quick and her line was, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm painting you. And all she says is, why? And he says, because you're so beautiful. And then because he said that, she very slowly pulls the covers oh, down. Now, she took direction very well. Yeah. But on the third take, just to see what the actor would do that she was playing against, mm -hmm. he said, I, um, she, when she slowly was going to pull it down, he says, I'll give you two quid. And that's when she starts to pull the covers down because she's going to get two quid. Yeah, yeah. And she had lived and said, I would have done it for one. Oh, that's <laughs> that was good. so funny. And it was so good. Oh and he got God. so embarrassed. I thought, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, let me tell you another example. Back in the 80s, I was trying to be an actor. And I was lucky enough to get on the Unsolved Mysteries episode. People okay. can watch this today on YouTube. <laughs> I think uh, 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 Unsolved Mysteries is free. You may have to have some yeah, kind of hookup. Yeah, it's on YouTube, yeah. But what was interesting is... I w w it was the one where they escaped from Alcatraz. Okay. So I'm playing one of these criminals, right? And I kept asking the director, I said, aren't you going to give us some lines? He goes, no. I want you to do what you feel would be in the scene because you might do something that I hadn't thought of. Right. And I want it to look like we're filming the actual event, you know. And I, I kept that in mind, and that's what I do with my fellow musicians, and that's what I did in directing. Well, how would you feel if you were a captain? Right, and you that's know. the great thing because you get the people to play. They are immersed into that yes. character. So yes. how would that character react? You don't want Sometimes a robot. you do have to go off script, yeah. yeah. You don't want a robot. I'm doing what the director told me. You know, you don't want that. No, no. <laughs> we are talking about writing, so we're okay here, even though yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it got off base a little bit. Yeah. But, all right, so that's what your science fiction book's about. Yeah, and let me give them a, uh, people a little teaser. There is a planet called Plentus, which is where people have been banished to and it's the age-old fight between the elders and the young people. The young people say, hey, we're not supposed to be here. And the elders say, oh, give it up. We've been here for years. You're not going to get off. What are you going to do? We don't even have rockets to fly off from the planet. But they're keeping up on it. On Rarkel, which is where they were banished from, okay. there is a change in the leadership. But the leadership in place does not want new leadership because they'll find out all these murky things they've been doing and there's a twist in this story where you think the villains are going to win it all but they don't mm -hmm. but wait till you read what happens that mm -hmm. catch the villains oh my gosh so it sounds like you had fun writing this oh story. my gosh and then there's an epilogue because i list out the various characters and what happened to them and that is a poignant part of it because people don't want to read a story and gee i wonder what happened to this guy that guy this girl you know I actually tell what in the epilogue, you know, years later, this, you know, and it kind of wraps the story. And that actually up sets it up for another book. It does too. Oh yeah. yeah, it does. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Banished. Yeah. So what's the next book? Yeah, the next one here is the book that I wrote when I was speaking about earlier, when I wanted to help out, and I didn't want to go into politics because it's so rife with money and then owing people favors. So I decided to write a book, and I t uh, titled it. Plan for America and the World. And I wanted to start off by just reading a, sure. a quick little piece from the beginning of the book, which tells the purpose of the book. To educate 
motivate, activate, bring up to a need for change, a demand for improvement, so that we see results and we never lose our freedoms and liberties. Everything about this book is to empower people. On the chapter where I talk about welfare, we, yes, we want to help people with welfare, but it's not a lifestyle. We want them in job training so they can stand on their own because people feel really good when they're making their own way. And Absolutely. I, I want to live in a country where people are feeling good because if you give and give and give to people, it starts to erode them mm -hmm. from within because they're, they're not exchanging anything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I actually started a charity years ago when I lived in Atlanta, Georgia in 1990. And one of the premises was is that we didn't use taxpayers' dollars. Yeah. That you involve the community that we were trying to improve and you get the people in the community to work to earn the money, to create the money for right. changing, you know, the neighborhood. Right. And and I do believe that empowering them and making them feel good about they raise that money. Yeah. They weren't given that money, they raise that money. I know. You just give them the tools to help raise the money with. Right. Um, and I do think that that makes a huge difference. Well, the other thing I talk about in a book, in a chapter on prisoners, now I'm not saying a psychotic killer, a psychotic killer, or someone who has murdered people, but I'm saying somebody who did blue collar crime, why do we put them in jail? And now the taxpayer has to pay for their dental care, their food, their rent for 25 years. We have so many problems in this world. Let's take the ones that are not really dangerous and say, no, you're not going to jail, but look what you did. You ripped off all these people every weekend for the next 20 years. You're going to be doing community service work to make up for what you've done. Now that sends a message to people. Do I want to be doing community service work for 20 years? I don't think I'm going to, you know, hit this 7-Eleven like I was planning. Well, you know, and interesting what you say about that. And I know we're talking a little bit of politics here, but yeah. the prison system is a business. Yeah. Um, I have uh, someone who I work with, I helped write his book, mm -hmm. and he is a lifer. Um, he was uh, accused and convicted of murdering someone. Okay. He did not, he isn't the one who actually murdered this person, but because he was a participant as far as being yeah. there, yeah. he got a life sentence. Wow. Now he was a young kid, belonged to a gang in New York, oh boy. he was an immigrant, didn't know any better. And I do believe he's very remorseful for what he what happened. In fact, I know he is. Yeah. But unfortunately, he will spend his entire life in prison. He's constantly trying to get appeal. Right. But with the system the way it's set up, even though it can be proven he wasn't the one who murdered this person, right. uh, which was originally what he was found guilty of, it it's such a, a business that, first of all, these prisoners get moved around about every right. six or seven years if right. you're a lifer. Right. And it's based on... A, it's almost like bidding on a book, like I'll put it in my store for 40 oh percent and I'll put it in for 40. It's, it's, it's really a business and I think that's part of the problem we yeah. have with the prison system. How long has he been in jail, this individual? Right now he's been in prison since 1995. So that's about 20 years. Yeah, Okay, 20 years. so imagine if for 20 years he was doing community service work and then you multiply that by how many people we have who are not really dangerous in our prison system the world would be an amazing helped place. Right. And so would the individuals, you see. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I do believe he should have done some time. And he does say of that course, too. Of course, because he because did murder somebody. Even yes. though he was a young kid, he wasn't yeah. of age yet, yeah. um, he still was there when this happened. So he himself will tell you, I, I deserve some of this. Yeah, and I think but some But to spend his entire time. life in prison, yeah. though, yeah. you know, I do think we, re we have to examine each person individually yeah. and see what's going on there. But anyway, that's why I like what you, you've written here, because it does help open up our eyes, see things in a different way, mm -hmm. and just re-examine where we are in this society. Right. So, right. Yeah. Even with students, boy, I have a, a, a quite lengthy dissertation on what we should be teaching our young people so that they are completely, fully functional. Now, I talk a lot about what I call, and others have called, the power elite. These small group of individuals that are trying to manipulate things for their own end. They're not political. They are control-based. And they do not want a population who is bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and when the senator's up there and they say, Senator, what about the $40 million that is missing? I'm so glad you asked me that question. Now, uh, yes, you in the back. Wait, wait, Senator, you didn't answer my question. They do not want a population like that. They want, 
Yeah, whatever. Okay, fine. Ask his question then. Go ahead. You know. No, I want a empowered, bright. I'm going to ask you this question until you answer it. Young people, population, and that's what this book is all about. And I think you're seeing that more and more in the younger generation. Yeah, I, I'm very pleased. Answers. Yeah, I'm yeah. very pleased. Yeah. All right. So, writing these books, yeah. what was that like for you? Because I know you're a journalist. You, you yeah. already shared yeah. how you you wrote, you know, about automobiles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when you sat down to do the novel, did you just sit down one day and say, "This is what I'm going to do"? How did you decide the format? On the novel, I just said, "Okay, I, I, I here's my." I did do a little bit of an outline, saying, "Okay, we got to have this planet. Okay, what if they were banished? Okay." And I, it kind of fell together that way. Now, the fun part for any writers who are watching, I have the young person on the banished planet, Perel Kelm. Mm -hmm. Now, I was going, Perel Kelm. Oh, Perel Kelm, you know. And then I needed to have a name that instilled yeah. ugliness. Yeah. And the evil guy is Drellen Norris. <laughs> <laughs> You say his name, that guy's bad news, I yeah, can yeah, tell, yeah. you know. And then uh, the, the, the person like Obi-Wan Kenobi is Sarah Mian Tabor. Okay. Has that lineage yeah, about yeah. it, you know. And, and the, the young person who's trying to take over leadership on Raquel is Flaren Tesmerend. Okay. <laughs> I like what you're doing because you're, you're thinking ahead into the future. Yeah. Like futuristic names as yeah. opposed to what yeah. were common names we know today. Yeah, it had to be. And there's a couple of things in there I wanted to share with you. I wanted to throw a few twists and turns. So the drink that many of them like is called a Smarsh Ale. Okay. And it only becomes carbonated once it goes into your body. Oh, okay. So you drink it like... <laughs> you know. uh, Phonatello instead of a phone. Uh, the doctors are called medicals. And Ceramy and Tabor, who's a little bit highbrow, he only drinks ice from asteroids. Okay? Oh, okay. Very high in mineral content. <laughs> you know, and I had a lot of fun with that. And just sat there and, and wrote uh, the story all the way through, went back again, and kind of carved out the names. And that's how I did that. It was just, it was more fun. This was quite interesting to know, well, what do I want to cover? What are the hot topics that, that will be hot topics in the next five or ten years? So that was, it was a whole different approach, you know. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. When I first started writing, I thought, how am I going to come up with names for my characters? Because yeah. you really can't use family members' names too much. No, no, kind of no. Thing. So <laughs> I used to be a waiter, and I sometimes would, bank, or would, would work banquets. Yeah. And I remember saving the name tags from this banquet. Oh, my. And then I would take the name tags and, and I would switch them around. Match person, yes, last of names. course. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. this is perfect. I'm kind of with all the names I need yeah, for my characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did it verbally. I just went to Perel, Perel, uh, see Sarah, Sarah, me and uh, Raber, Rober, Tabor, Sarah, me and Tabor, you know. Uh, so that was very fun. Now, it, interesting in this book, it's not just, okay, it's going to talk about social problems, all that. I have a section in the back of movies that I suggest people watch again, if they have already seen, or for the first time, if they've never seen them, that back up some of my contentions in here and give them a chance to go, wow, I've never thought of that. Let me give you an example, the movie The Firm. Okay. The character gets into The Firm, they get him on a beach with a woman, they get photographs, now he's entrapped. And, I, and when I started writing this book and I was gonna add that movie, to the back of the book, I said, that is not about a lawyer's office. That is what they do to our senators. They get in there wanting to do a good thing. They get dirt on them or they make up dirt on them now. Right. Okay, you're gonna have to vote this way, Senator. Otherwise, we'll release file 621. Right, you know, right, so. right, right. Yeah, and it is a shame, but that's pretty much the way it is. Yeah, so that's in there too. And people will have fun, I think, looking at the movies or remembering the movies and, you know, JFK is in there and Missing with Sissy Spacek and Jack Lemmon, which is a movie that details the coup that was done in Chile and some of our government's involvement, unfortunately. Yeah. You know. yeah. I want to get into a little bit about the publishing end of it. Sure. Okay. Sure. When you set out to publish this, you published it under your own name, 
Well, you, you, you yeah. created a name for the publishing company. Yeah, Copperfield uh -huh. Publishing. You actually told me a story about that. Oh, it, I can tell it real quick. Fahrenheit 451, they burn books. And the fireman sees this woman burned up who will not leave her house. And he secretly takes David Copperfield and runs away to these radicals who are reading the book, memorizing it, and then destroying the book so that when the society gets sane, they can be brought in, okay, recite the book so we don't lose our culture. Right. When I heard that, Copperfield, Copperfield. And I, so now, Copperfield Music, Copperfield Publishing, Copperfield Artworks, it speaks of freedom of thought to me. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, that's where it came from. So I know your son is the producer of your books. He's the one yeah, who manufactures them. Yeah, yeah, manufactures, yeah. right. Um, and your layout. Well, I want to talk a little bit about it. It's really important because I'm a self-published author. I started okay. publishing in okay. 1995. It was at a time when self-publishing was not cool. You yeah. know, you didn't go anywhere if you were self-published. Yeah, yeah, I know. So I it was a that, tough yeah. road to hoe, and you had to really work hard to get it in a store. Right. I was lucky I was able to do all that. Um, the thing is, is that one of the things we talk about oftentimes is you got a great cover. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have an ISBN. No, we talked about it, that. inside. Because you but didn't really, yeah. you didn't do this to go out and say I want to sell a million copies of this. Yeah, because I, I want this book out there to help the world, you know. Right. And the other thing I want to say before I forget, real quick, this was published by Franklin Printing. Uh -huh. Franklin Printing will make posters for Democrats, Republicans. Sometimes they do other things. It doesn't mean that if you come to Franklin and you find something here you don't agree with, you shouldn't use Franklin. No. They publish all sorts of things. This doesn't represent the Franklin viewpoint Printing. of Franklin Print. And we yeah. even talked about that with my show. Yeah. We talked about how at one time I was on the air at KLAV, and uh -huh. when I was on the air, I had someone call in and say, you're talking about this man's book. Right. It's about Christianity. Right. This person happened to be Jewish. And I said, well, it does, you know, I know I'm not a political show, but when someone writes a book, we have to talk about the book. Yeah. And if that's what his book's about, what am I supposed to say? Yeah. You know, and I think that's what people don't understand. When we yeah. do something like your son's doing, yeah. he publishes anybody. If oh, you yeah. have a book yeah. and you need to get it printed, yeah. call Franklin Printing and right. they will help you. Right. Um, it, that's not what he is. He's not there to say this is wrong, that's right. No, it's, he's you know. not at all. So, anyway, so we're, I just wanted to Yeah, and that's that. important. And that is important, but um, one of the things I want to talk about is, is things you can do differently. Sure. And we've looked at both your books. Yeah. And mm -hmm. one of the things is, I think this has commercial value. Okay. And other than just getting the copies from you. Yeah. So I would go ahead and get an ISBN. Okay. Which you can sign yourself and you, up. And, and for, for the people that don't know, it goes right back here. In the back of the book. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's so you can get it in the stores. But yeah. also, see, so it's easier to sell it online that way as well. Sure. Because you can go to multiple outlets then. Right. Um, and you can go online to KDP Publishing, and which is through Amazon, mm -hmm. and they can assign one, or you can buy your own. The, the advantage you have of buying your own is you have complete control over your book. Right. Where who right. buys it, where it's printed, that kind yeah. of thing. So I would recommend that for you. Okay. And that's done through Bowker. Okay. Um, and it's B O W E K R. I'm going to get with you later and, and write all this stuff down. Yeah, At yeah. my age, I'm not going to remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and then, then, then you can do what's called my identifiers through them, and then you're set. And, yeah. and you really, all you have to do is add that to your book. Yeah. Your and, and then you, you mentioned a couple yeah. of interesting things. I don't know if they can see this, but, you know, just moving that over a little bit Tiny so bit. it's not so close. Yeah. Right. You know. Because, right. Yeah. So that, that's an easy fix, too. Yeah. For yeah. the most part, you, that's done right. The other yeah. book we were talking about, which is a great book. Is the prints too small? Yes, and that's very. And you even admitted that. Yeah, yeah, because my son said, "Hey, let's just do a limited number of these. Yeah, let's yeah, knock you're it just out." Just do them to hand out. Yeah, so. exactly. But if you can see that, yes, it needs to be bigger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You always have to be careful about that. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. in today's society, especially like someone with me with eyesight problems, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the bigger the print, the better. Yeah. So you know, that's that's a key thing to keep in mind. And that book also doesn't have an ISBN. But no. once you become an established publisher. You'll always have that prefix for as a publisher okay. for, to create an okay. ISBN for each one of your okay. books. So those are key things. Yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out mm -hmm. because we talked about a mutual friend who started off on my radio show, first yep. show ever. Uh, and I'll never forget when he published his first book, he did not have a website. He didn't have any. And now we were talking about how now he's like the pro. 
He's just at getting out there and getting amazing. Started local. I just did a book event with him yeah. that he invited me to. It's and just, you can mention his name. Yeah, St Stephen, Stephen Murray. Stephen Murray, yeah. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's amazing how you can, and that was like eight years ago, but it's amazing how you can go from here to here relatively fast, because I know yeah. that sounds like a long time, but right. eight years isn't that long. In you fact, know, he's now published four novels, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, when you're my age, you know, you, you can write a press release on paper, print it out, it's on paper, and then the thought of going online to do something sometimes can be a little daunting. Don't let it be. <laughs> Listen to what this gentleman is saying. I did want to mention one thing. Sure. I do have a bookmark for the book, and on the back are several organizations that help out with study, with drug detox, mental health. The one that I think is most important, because I think children and, and students are the future of any country and that is the information about drugs that come from the and i've got it right here www.drugfreeworld.org they have books on marijuana in spanish and english and they have books on everything inhalants alcohol heroin anything somebody could be involved with now here's the key thing especially for any young people watching we're not going to give you these booklets and tell you not to use the stuff we're going to say this is what it will do to you. Now you decide. And I think or that's it's just like fun. alcohol. Yeah. Learn how to use it in moderation. Yes, of course. You know, um, yeah. because you don't want to offend someone. I mean, I know people who smoke marijuana all the yeah. time. Yeah. But the thing is, is that it's no different than drinking alcohol. Because right. I'm not a big component of believing in going out there and getting drunk every night and that kind of right. thing either. Right. So, you know, I think anything is in moderation is fine. Yeah. And I think that. Education is our best Education tool. Education is the best tool. In, in the war against drugs, because if people find out, let, let's let's leave marijuana out of it for a moment, and you know someone's not abusing alcohol, but doing something like heroin or inhalants or abusing Ritalin, and you say you're going to have trouble holding a job if you have a children that you want to have later in life, they could come out deformed. The person then has some decisions they can make about if they want to use these kind of drugs or not. And that helps the country. And I like that you did this. I'm going to tell you why. Because I actually deal with a neighbor of mine who's a senior. Mm -hmm. And I take him back and forth to the doctors. And he was recently prescribed a drug mm -hmm. to because he was depressed and wanted to kill himself. Yeah. So I am in charge of giving him one pill a day. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because if you gave him the whole pill bottle, he was past, he went through the whole thing, staying in a rehab thing, and got past that. But what if he has a relapse and wants yeah, to get rid of himself? Yeah. He'll just take the it's whole thing. It's just easy. So that's kind of what you're doing here. You're right. saying, okay, everything in moderation yeah. and the way it's supposed to be used. Sometimes right. we're given drugs for a reason. Yeah, and education on things like heroin and inhalants is very important. Yeah. Because then it'll tell you what these things will do to you, which a young person may not know. Right. And, you know, they all think they're invincible. And I'm sure some of this is in your book. Oh, absolutely. I have chapters. But it, I, I love that I pass these out. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll be in Walmart, let's say. And someone says, oh, I just have so much trouble, you know, with my, my son. I, well, here, take this and go to one of these organizations and get some free materials. Mm -hmm. So that's really fun, too. Yeah. You know. Yeah. All right. Do you... Now, I know you're a journalist, you've written two novels, you're a songwriter. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, how long have you been writing songs? Since the late 70s, okay. I was given a guitar that I owned because the band that I was in, I was the only one with the money to buy it. When the band broke up, they said, see you later, here's your guitar. So I started noodling around on the guitar, which is, means you're just playing around on it. And I just fell in love with songwriting. You know, the writing thing is a stream through my life. And what I like about what I'm hearing from you is, is that you're a journalist, you, you write articles, yeah. you are a songwriter, yeah. you're a novelist, yeah. um, and, and I think what people fail to understand, when you're a creator, a creator mm -hmm. of something, mm -hmm. oftentimes a, an author is pigeonholed. Um, they're told that you write science fiction, you stick right, with science right, fiction. Right. You write horror, you stick with horror. Yeah. And I'm finding more and more, even the bigger authors, Heather Graham's an example. She's a romance novelist. Okay. But Heather has broken away and she created her own publishing company so that she could write what she wants, which is horror. Wow. Because her traditional publisher, her big traditional publisher, yeah. said, no, this is what we want from you because yeah. this is what you're good at. It'd be like the Eagles doing, you know, punk rock or something. You know, they're, in the old days when 
the record company had signed them, they don't want the Eagles putting on, you know, Kiss makeup and playing. Right. No, that's not what you guys do. You're like, you know, acoustic guitars and some electric guitars and you're kind of laid back music, you know, they get, they got pigeonholed themselves, you know. Well, and I think it stifles the creative aspect of yeah. all of us. And yeah. sometimes that can be dangerous mm -hmm. because then you're thinking, but I want to do this, I want right. to do that. Right. And you kind of get bored with the whole process at yeah. that point. Yeah, you do. So I'm like you, I, I, I love the idea that you're writing everything. <laughs> yeah. Whatever comes to your mind, put it on paper. Yeah. And I encourage people to do that all the time. Don't pigeonhole yourself. Right. And I started an organization with another environmentalist called Advanced Technology Research. I'm just about to get the website finished up. And that is a clearinghouse for information with the only proviso, even though I speak out against the fact that people are saying human activity is causing the planet to warm. There is some factual information about that. It is really not that I'm totally right, that the planet is cooling, or they're totally wrong, the planet's warming. We have six billion people counting on us to get it right. right. And so I like, in the marketplace, you know, if you go to uh, a vegetable stand, do you just want carrots? Come on, you want to have everything there so you can right. make a choice. Exactly. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're going to be talking on another show about your global warming and, and yeah, all, all that. Yeah, all that stuff. All right, so thank you so much, Brian, for being on. Oh, my gosh, thank you for having me on. And please get a hold of the book wherever you can. And I believe that the responsibility for the condition mm -hmm. of this world is always up to us to some degree. So is there a website they can write to you to get the book right now? Until we get you published officially. Yeah, yeah. They can go to planforamericaandtheworld.org. Okay. And they can email me there. Okay. And I don't mind giving my email out at Go all. Go ahead. It's B Gardner, G A R D N E R, B Gardner, 2323 at yahoo.com. Now, here's the great thing in today's world if you want a copy of the book, I will not charge you. I will just email you a copy of the book because I want to get the book out there. If you want a hard copy, yeah, then there's postage. And I, I want to charge you something for the book because I have to hey. pay money to, to get them reprinted. But my objective is to get this book out there so that we never lose our freedoms and liberties. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the oh, show, Thank Brian. you for having me on. And just remember, if you can dream it, you can write it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Aspects of Writing. We hope you will join us next week as we discuss every aspect of the writing industry. Until then, if you can dream it, you can write it.